The Overwhelmed Brain is a proud member of the Healing Broadcast Network. Are you annoyed by affirmations? When you spill coffee on yourself on your way to a job interview and your best friend tells you to think positively, they won't judge you on your appearance. Do you breathe a huge sigh of relief knowing they'll just ignore that giant wet spot? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then get ready to start creating the life you've always wanted now. This is Paul Coliani, host of The Overwhelmed Brain, the personal growth show for the critical thinker. On every episode, we'll talk about practical, down-to-earth steps to help you improve your mood and keep you sane in this powerful journey we call life. I want to help you bridge the gap between your emotions and reason, causing you to discover why you do the things you do and what you can do to reach higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress and overwhelm. If you're here to learn more common sense tips for improving your life, you're in the wrong place. This is the direct path to uncommon sense, and that's why it's going to help you learn, heal, grow, and evolve. Today's quote is by Marianne Williamson, and it's this. Allopathic doctors used to laugh condescendingly at those who posited that psychological, emotional, and spiritual factors were important contributors to the sickness as well as the healing of the body. I think for far too long the concept of separating psychology from physiology or the mind from the body has probably prevented us from getting well in many areas of our life. But I know firsthand in my own life when I've had emotional issues, psychological or things going on in my head that I just couldn't get rid of, thoughts, self-talk or a number of thought processes that have gone on that have affected me physically. One of the things that happened to me when I was married is that I used to carry around a lot of anger. My wife would do something that would trigger me, and instead of getting angry, I didn't want to disturb the relationship, and I wanted to show her that, hey, I'm a nice guy. (laughs) I didn't show my anger. And what that did is force my body to put it somewhere. And where did it go? Well, for me, it went to my stomach. What was happening to me is that I would develop um, an acidic stomach. And it would cause my my breath to be really bad. And for a couple of years, I went around very self-conscious of my breath, of my halitosis. <laughs> and what I would do is uh, I would take Tums, I would take um, antacids to to neutralize the effect of the acid in my stomach. And I also changed my diet. I couldn't eat any more tomato sauce. It was highly acidic. I couldn't eat onions, or at least raw. And there were a few other things that I probably shouldn't have eaten that I didn't even know that were causing the problem uh, to exacerbate in my stomach. So I had a lot of issues going on in my stomach because I held anger down. Now, how did I figure all this out? I finally got to a point where I was able to grow into fuller, uh, more authentic expression of my emotions. There was a point in my relationship when I was married when uh, she said that I was acting like a boy all the time. And you've probably heard me talk about this before, but there was a point where she said, don't act like you're a child because I feel like I'm your mother. And that That really hit. That hit hard. And I was like, I thought, I don't understand. What do you mean? And she would repeat something that I would say. Like, do you mind if I eat before you? Uh, That won't bother you, will it? That won't make you angry, will it? It was something like that. I don't remember exactly what I said. But just those comments. And you can tell the energy in my voice. And probably the, the way I was holding myself and my body language. She could probably see that every little nuance 
of my comment or question or the way I talked with her painted me as this scared child, afraid to disturb the waters, afraid to rock the boat. So that's how she knew me for many years. And she couldn't figure out why it bothered her until one day she realized what was happening. And I didn't know because I thought I was just being accommodating. I thought I was being a nice guy. I was being non-confrontational. And it was driving her crazy. The reason was because I wasn't showing my true emotions. I wasn't expressing myself. She never saw me angry because I chose to repress that. I chose to repress that anger. And that's what caused my stomach issues. That's what caused the acid buildup in my stomach. Because I had some things I wanted to say but chose not to say them. I had some uh, thoughts and feelings going on inside of me but didn't want to upset her, didn't want to risk her leaving me or getting a divorce or anything like that. So I was beating myself up. I was swallowing these negative emotions and starting to create physical symptoms inside of me, physical problems inside of me. And of course, this did affect our relationship. The worse it got, the worse my breath got. And that's a problem when you want to kiss your spouse. (laughs) It was just hard. It was just hard to handle and because I didn't know how to fix this problem and it didn't seem to be getting any better. But a long story short, one day she said, you're acting like a little boy. And I was like, I don't understand what you mean. And she said, I need you to express what's really on your mind. I need you to express yourself like a man. And again, that just hit me hard because I wasn't doing that. And I had a a realization that I wasn't doing that. Because if I did that, it might upset her. And my thought process was, if you upset the one you love, they will either hurt you or leave you. And it was a childhood belief. I took it, I took it with me into the adult world where I believed that uh, I was still in a dysfunctional family where the people that I love got drunk and were dangerous. Yet, my wife never showed any type of threatening behavior like that. So why would I still have this belief? You know, some of us are like this. We bring in this childhood programming and keep following that programming, thinking that's the way it is supposed to be. Well, that realization that day when she said, I want you to express yourself, she went on and said, I want you to express yourself no matter what. I want you to express yourself whether you're angry at me, uh, even if you you don't like something that I'm doing, I want to hear it. I want to know the real you. I want to know what your thoughts are. Don't hold back. And so that was a big step forward for me. That was a huge step forward. It might have been one of the most (laughs) evolved moments of my life because my entire life had been repressing keeping down what I really wanted to say, not expressing how I really feel because it might upset the other person. I chose to swallow my anger, swallow my sadness, swallow any feelings that I got because it might upset the other person. And in reality, what was happening is that I was making myself sicker and sicker. And these stomach issues came up and I couldn't eat one of my favorite foods, pizza, anymore without taking some sort of antacid afterward, which did help. However, the problem was chronic. It would not go away. But the reprieve happened almost immediately when I started expressing myself. When I took a leap of faith one day And instead of saying something from the viewpoint or perspective of a little boy, which is what I'd been doing, I chose to stand up and be a man and say, that makes me angry. Or whatever I said, it was, it was something that either she did or I felt, uh, but it was my opportunity to see if this worked. (laughs) You know, I didn't know that repressing uh, negative thoughts were, was making me sick at the time, but I did want to 
get beyond this little boy viewpoint that my wife had for me. So I decided, okay, you want to hear what I'm really thinking and you want to see what it's like for me to stand up and honor myself and be a man, you're going to get it. (laughs) And I did. And it was hard. But I remember her face when I stood up for myself for the first time. I don't remember what it was about. But I remember her going, wow, what you just did turned me on. And I was like, what? (laughs) It was the total opposite reaction than I expected. She saw this masculinity come out in me, from me, for the first time. I mean, probably for the first time ever. She saw this masculine strength come out of me. And she's like, wow, I have never seen that side of you. I've never seen this in you. Even though I might have been angry at something that she did, she saw it come out. And it was the first time that I got to experience what it was like to truly honor my inner thoughts, my inner expression, stuff that I've been holding back, holding down. And you know what? It felt pretty damn good. It felt really good. In fact, those good feelings that I got it just washed through my body. Now, I don't care if you're a man or a woman, this masculine energy of standing up for yourself and honoring who you are is a huge step forward. If you're not doing it now, I suggest that you start doing it in small ways so that you don't have a buildup of physiological ailments that you don't have a buildup of sickness and pain and other things that could be happening in your body because you're choosing not to honor yourself. You're choosing not to be fully authentic. Because when I started doing that, I immediately felt relief. It didn't go away. There was still damage in my system. There was still damage in my stomach. And I still, even to this day, can't eat raw onion and can't consume too much tomato sauce, but 98% of it went away. 90, the fact that I can eat any tomato sauce is, is a miracle. The fact that I can eat pizza with lots of garlic on it is a miracle. But I did cause some damage in the sense that my stomach is now more sensitive than it was before I started holding on to all that anger. But the, the fact that I stopped holding on to anger helped it heal, helped me be able to eat the foods I like again, helped me to give up antacids unless I need them in extreme cases. I can directly attribute expressing my true thoughts and feelings, being my authentic self to becoming physically well. Now, this is just my opinion, my experience, what I went through. So I You know, if you are having similar issues or you're having physical symptoms that you can't figure out what's causing them, you know, certainly do your best to see a professional, see a doctor and get your diagnosis and whatever else needs to be done by people who have studied this stuff for years and years and years. All I know is that as soon as I started expressing myself and stopped repressing, holding back, swallowing those negative emotions my physical body started feeling better. When I was able to express some of the painful, hard stuff to express, no matter what the cost, no matter what price I had to pay, if someone left me, if someone got angry at me, if they yelled at me, if I can express and accept the consequences that someone might not be happy with what I said, at least I would be honoring myself. And what that did was made me feel better. It had a physiological effect. I truly believe that our emotions have physiological effects. In fact, that's probably why we call them feelings, (laughs) because we feel our emotions in our body. We feel happy because our body feels different. It feels positive. It just has this sensation. I get it in my chest. When I feel angry, I get it in my stomach. When I feel sad, I feel it in my chest. So it only makes sense that if 
We aren't expressing these feelings, that they're staying in the body, causing problems. Again, my non-PhD opinion. That's what worked for me. Maybe it'll work for you. Let's go to our next segment, Ask Paul. All right, welcome back. You know that once a week, if you've been listening, uh, we talk to Asha. She is with GetOutOfTheMess.com, and she answers questions regarding Legal Shield, which is basically a service that you can get a team of attorneys to help you out with situations that you come up against in your life, some legal situations that you might need to face. And that comes at the tiny little monthly price of like less than 20 bucks a month. So this week I want to ask Asha about pre-existing conditions. Can I sign up for this legal insurance and get these attorneys on my side if I already have a legal situation going on? If if I'm already in the middle of something, can I still sign up for the service and can they help me with what's happening there? So I'm going to let Asha take it from here and we'll see what she has to say. Yes, you can sign up. Yes, they can help you. And especially if you need representation, you can always hire representation and still get the discounts. The caveats are that if you get a traffic ticket and then you sign up and you want free traffic ticket you know, coverage, that doesn't work. You have to have had your plan for 45 days. I think it's 45 days before you're covered for a traffic ticket, a new traffic ticket. They don't want people just signing up, covering the ticket, and then canceling. You know, that's inappropriate. The other thing is, if you want to take advantage of the free uncontested divorce option, where they'll actually provide you a free divorce as far as legal paperwork goes, if it's uncontested, that you have to have been a member for at least 90 days, I believe. I'd have to look up the numbers, but I know those are two incidents that are not covered retroactively. Also... Um, You do have coverage if you ever get audited by the IRS. However, that coverage only applies if you had Legal Shield during the year that the IRS is doing the audit for. So those are the three primary exclusions. Other and you can always get you know better rates on their services for representation, but you're not going to be covered for the free services that they provide. With that said, everything else, uh, I have had a couple people already call me saying, well, I have an incident that involved a car accident where someone hit me saying uh, in the last month saying that they have issues where, you know, the insurance companies aren't wanting to pay and they keep pushing back. The insurance companies know that most people don't know what to do and they just assume that that's the way it's going to be and they give up. Where if you have an attorney, you can really do something about that. You can get at least a letter sent or further, depending on how much money is involved and how far it's worth you going. But absolutely, yes, you can get advice on pretty much anything. And you can get um, free letters for pretty much anything. All right. Thank you so much for your time today, Asha. And should people go directly to the Legal Shield site if they want to talk to you or get more information? No, you definitely want to go to the overwhelmedbrain.com and click the get out of the legal mess button. Or you can always email me directly, Asha, that's A-S-H-A at getoutofthemess.com. Or you can call me at 678-355-8777. But please do go through my links because if you don't go through my links, then the overwhelmed brain doesn't get any credit for it. And real quick, how much do you charge to answer people's questions? Nothing. It's free to talk to me. I mean, not for hours. (laughs) But I can certainly answer any questions. And if I don't know the answer, I can look it up and get the answer. All right. Thanks again, Asha. All right. Here we are at the Ask Paul segment. This is where I read a listener email on the air and do my best to answer and help them through a challenge. Today's email is from Jill, which is one of the names I use to keep you anonymous when you write me an email and I read it on the air. Here it is. My husband has been unfaithful and it has been 
uh, several years since I found out. He has completely changed his lifestyle and has committed himself to me and our family. He has taken responsibility and attended therapy. However, I've struggled with my negative thoughts. I was and I'm still unable to accept what has happened. I've realized that since I decided to stay in the marriage that I was sabotaging myself and I've been listening over and over to your podcasts. They're helping me and although it feels forced, I hope to stay with it and change those negative pathways that I've developed. I wanted to let you know as I sense from you a commitment to helping others and I encourage you to keep on fighting the good fight. Jill, first of all, thank you so much for expressing yourself here. I am honored that you would share this with me and I've kept you anonymous and I haven't replied to you an email for a couple months now, so I apologize about that. But I wanted to read this on the air because so many people are in your shoes right now. So many people have gone through this emotional, what I call emotional murder. It's infidelity. It's betrayal. It's when you give your heart to someone and hope that they treat it kindly. Hope that they treat it as if it were their own. The problem is a lot of people don't do that. Well, many people don't do that. They take your heart and on their way to someone else, they throw it out the window and it lands in a ditch and then it just sits there until they come back and they pick it up and they come home and they see you. Now, I'm painting an awful picture here and I apologize about that, but I want to convey that that's what it feels like when emotional betrayal of any sort happens especially cheating on your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend when you're with someone and they give you their loyalty and their faith and their trust it's a huge responsibility it's something that you either take in and go wow this person trusts me of all people in this world they trust me with their heart they trust me to help them feel safe. They trust me knowing that I have their most vulnerable part of them. That I am holding on to the part that feels the most pleasure and the most pain. And I have this responsibility. What am I going to do with it? How am I going to handle this? Am I going to be sensitive and caring knowing that one little bump hurts that heart, hurts that person, or one big bump completely devastates them, how am I taking on this responsibility? You know, it's kind of a fear-based mentality in a way, but it's not such a bad thing to think about when you have someone else's heart. I have my girlfriend's heart. She trusts me. I don't know how much she trusts me. <laughs> But she trusts me to the point where she can tell me things, very vulnerable things about herself, hoping that I won't tell other people. When she sinks into my arms, she knows that I'm not going to hurt her. When we go our separate ways during the day, she knows that I'm not going to share what I share with her with anyone else. When you can get to that point in a relationship, you bond more than anything you could ever imagine. The problem I see a lot of is that both of you bond like that and then one or sometimes both doesn't hold up their end of the bargain, doesn't hold up their end of responsibility of holding on to that heart and keeping it protected, keeping it safe. One of you might step out of the relationship and betray that heart. And Jill, if you haven't heard my episode on infidelity, I highly recommend you go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com, use a little search bar there, and look for infidelity. And you'll see the episode where I talk about this more extensively. Now, before I address your challenge here, Jill, I want to kind of say a blanket statement that's very important for anyone that might be considering cheating, that might be considering stepping out of the relationship. And anyone who's already done this uh, will benefit from this as well. If you feel the need to step out of the relationship, to get your needs, your emotional or physical needs met by someone else, please consider giving the person's heart back first. 
And I think you know what I mean by this, but I'll explain. If you are in a relationship and you want to step out of that relationship, do one of two things before you do it. One, tell the person you're with that you want to step out of the relationship. Tell the person that you want to get out of this situation so you can be with someone else. I know that's super easy, right? (laughs) Well, here's the thing. You're giving the relationship a chance for repair. You're giving the other person a chance to communicate. You're communicating your honest thoughts and feelings to this other person, knowing that it could and probably will lead to a breakup or divorce or whatever. But at least you're giving their heart back. You're not taking it with you and getting your needs met by someone else. Because that's the betrayal. That's the point that hurts the most, that you took their heart with you. Now, saying, hey, I want to break up, and then you go off and do your emotional or physical needs thing, at least they get their heart back. At least they get some sort of closure, even though they may not understand it, they may not like it, but at least you're not throwing their heart out the window as you leave. There's a difference between handing it to them and throwing it out the window as you go get your needs met somewhere else. So yes, I promote sharing with the other person that you are having thoughts and feelings about stepping outside of the relationship. Yes, it might and could lead to you breaking up or getting divorced, but it also will lead to conversation. Conversation is what needs to happen in order for any type of repair to take place. If you're not conversing then that's probably why you want to go out and betray your partner. Most people won't do this. That's why it's called cheating or betrayal because they will cheat on their partner so they don't have to face confronting their partner or telling their partner. Or maybe they want both, the best of both worlds. They want what their partner offers and what someone else offers. But either way, you're taking their heart that highest level of responsibility that you have and you're either going to crush it or you're going to nurture it. And if you really care about someone, I mean, if you really do love your partner, you always want to nurture that heart. You always want to care for that as if it were your own. Their heart is a precious jewel and it is valuable. And no matter what arguments you've had, no matter how mean you think the other person is or how evil they are and you want to go out and cheat or you know get back at them somehow give their heart back to them so that they can move on in some way shape or form now of course the ultimate goal in a relationship if you want to salvage it at all is to nurture the relationship to repair what has happened to communicate more to get therapy to do whatever you can to protect it to save it But, you know, sometimes people think that things have gone too far, that it's just not enjoyable being with the person anymore, so they go find someone else to fulfill those needs that aren't being met. That's one thing that I want you to do, is communicate and say, this is what I want to do. Now, the other thing that I want you to do is if you don't tell them, if you don't communicate with them exactly how you're feeling or what you want to do, then... At least get some closure in your current relationship first. When you're in a relationship and you've committed to each other, that closes off the outside world from interfering in that relationship, typically. But if you want to step out of that relationship, then do the other person a favor and give them a different type of closure by telling them you want to separate and go your own way for a while or permanently. Yes, it's basically breaking up or getting a divorce. I don't promote this. I don't promote cheating. I don't promote infidelity. But if you really have the desire, the the need to do it, give the other person in your life, the one who is the one who has handed you their heart and trusts you implicitly not to hurt it, not to crush it. Give it back to them again. I've already said it, but give it back to them no matter what so that they have some sort of closure, even if it's confusing, even if they don't understand so that you can get those needs met. Yes, I want you to repair your relationship. Yes, I want you to be honest with the other person. But don't commit the ultimate emotional crime of murder. Don't commit emotional murder. 
and betray your partner. Now, if you've already done it, I don't mean to make you feel bad, especially if you feel guilty about it and you're trying to figure out how to cope with those feelings. Go ahead and listen to that episode I did on infidelity because it does talk to both sides of this equation. But once you know what happens to the other person when you cheat, it makes you think twice and hopefully three times before you ever take that next step. And speaking of next steps, what is your next step, Jill? You found out about your husband's infidelity many years ago, and you said that he's a changed man. He's been going to therapy. He's changed his ways. His entire lifestyle has changed. Well, that's fantastic. There is absolutely a recovery after infidelity. And a lot of infidelity occurs because of a lack of communication, first of all. And that lack of communication is a lack of telling your partner what you really want and need in the relationship. I think what happens is that we get afraid that we're going to tell our partner what we really want and really need, and we think that they're going to leave us. So instead, we step out and we leave them temporarily and then come back doing this infidelity thing. But imagine if you were able to discuss honestly and openly with your partner what you really want. And they could say, wow, didn't know that. Let's try it. Or they might say, that's never going to (laughs) happen. It's possible. It could go either way. You just have to accept whatever happens. So, Jill, with your husband, it sounds like, you know, from what you tell me, that he doesn't want to ruin this relationship, that he wants to keep it with you. But you're in a place where you are unable to give your heart back 100%. And this is why I told you everything about handing your your heart to someone and trusting them implicitly. You're afraid to do that because you still have this negative association that when you give your heart to him, he is capable of crushing it. He is capable of hurting you. Now, why is that? Well, the obvious reason is because you don't fully trust him. And you can't get to a place of trusting him. So where can you go? What can you do? Well, the first thing you can do is come to a decision in yourself. Do I want this relationship indefinitely? Do I want it for the rest of my life? If the answer is absolutely yes, because everything is great or can be great, then you have to come to a point of acceptance that your heart could be hurt again. Now let me explain this. If you really do trust him and you really believe that this could work out, or at least you trust him enough that he won't cheat on you again, then come to a decision in yourself that you can be okay if your heart gets hurt again. That's the hardest thing to do. It's a full level of acceptance of the worst case scenario. I accept that it could happen again, but I'm not going to let it stop me from being happy today. This is why most people aren't happy, because they don't want to be. If I'm happy, he could hurt me. If I'm happy, she could hurt me. I'm telling you, there's one path out of this that's hard to take. It's a hard door to open, but once you do, you can feel good again. You can feel trusting again. The path is to accept what you see today and take the risk. Take the gamble. Know that anything could happen. Know that temptations are always around the corner, but there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do if, for example, it's your time to go. If you're in a situation and death comes, there's nothing you can do about it. Death comes. If that's hard to hear, that's something that you need to learn to accept. Because once you accept that it's your time, then you realize there's nothing you can do about it. People think that there is something they can do about things, and they live sometimes in misery thinking that they can change what's happening, or that they can change their thoughts about what's happening. When really the only thought that needs to change is that, Anything could happen at any time, 
And am I going to choose to accept to be happy and trusting in this moment, knowing what I know now? Or am I going to continue living in fear? Am I going to continue living without trust? Am I only going to give you half my heart just in case you do the same thing over again? Now, I know that's hard to take in because being able to accept means that you have to come to a place of 100% trust and faith in what's going on. And it's possible that you still have a little doubt or probably a lot of his faithfulness to you. But I tell you what, this is what's going to happen. As long as you keep mistrusting him, as long as you keep that vibe of not being able to love him as much as you could, not being able to have as much faith as you could, you will eventually drive him away. And I hate to say that, but it's true. Even though he's the one that went out and cheated and betrayed your trust in the first place, it sounds like he's made a commitment to change. And it sounds like he's kept that commitment. So what is your commitment? What is your commitment to this relationship? Are you going to trust knowing that, yes, he could break your heart again? It may not be cheating. It may be that he spends an hour more at work and you think it's something else. It could be a number of things. How long is he going to have to pay for what he did? I'm not excusing his behavior, but you found something in him that was worth keeping. And it may be you have a family and you know that he's a great dad too and that he's a great husband like almost all the time except for that. And when you have so much good in a relationship and the other person wants to keep it because they realize their mistake, then absolutely go for it. Absolutely try to do what you can to repair it. Now on top of that, the other question is, What led him to betray you in the first place? What led him to go down the road of lying to you? And has that been resolved? Because here's the big one. If you can get past this one thing, you can get past these feelings that you're having. Has the issue been resolved where he cheated on you? Now, what was the issue? Maybe you weren't communicating before, and so you hid things from each other, and that led to him going, you know what, I need someone that I can be honest with and communicate with without fear. For example, if he shared things with you and you always bit his head off and yelled at him, he might get more and more fearful about sharing things with you, so he finds someone else that he can tell things to, and now he's getting his needs met. Has Something like that happened? Or was it something else that caused him to not be honest with you and step outside the relationship? You need to figure out if that's been resolved. Because if it hasn't, it's going to happen again. Or if it doesn't happen again, there will be a disintegration of your relationship. And the person who cheated, who really did change his ways, will eventually feel resentment. And will eventually feel like, what am I doing here? I've done everything I can to make up for what I did, yet I still get treated like a criminal. Again, I'm not excusing his behavior. It should hang over his head for as long as you guys are together. But does it have to be something that interferes with your love, faith, and trust of one another? Can it become just a matter of fact? Like, yep, he cheated once and we went through it. We fixed the problems. Everything's great now. Or is it Yeah, he cheated, and I still think about it, and it still hurts me. Which it sounds like where you're at. So whatever caused him to be dishonest, to betray you, whatever that was, whatever that buildup was, is that resolved? Because if it isn't, that's probably why you still feel this way. And I'm telling you, 9 out of 10 times, or 99 out of 100 times, it's a communication thing. You don't want to communicate what's really on your mind. You don't want to say what's really in your thoughts because it might drive the other person away. Be okay with that. Be okay that, hey, I'm going to be 100% honest with you and you might leave me because of it. 
be okay. This works on both sides, both with the person who wants to cheat or the person who wants a great relationship and never wants to leave it. You have to be 100% honest when it comes to things that you're either going to repress and hold that negativity in, which seeps into the relationship in other ways, or you're going to say it and just put it out on the table, find out what happens. And if and when you stay together after that, you'll only be stronger as a couple. So Jill, those are the two main points I want to share with you. The last thing I want to share with you is to work on yourself in in the sense that you're doing what you can, listening to my podcast, uh, probably looking up some other uh, personal growth stuff or self-help stuff, probably looking for videos on infidelity and how to get over it. But what I want you to work on is especially your self-worth and your self-esteem. I have a feeling those took a big hit when you were cheated on. Because we always look at the other person and go, what does she have that I don't have? What does she do for him that I don't do for him? And that's a comparison parasite that you have on you. You compare yourself to other people. Let me just break it to you now. Someone is always going to be better than you in some way. (laughs) It's true. I hate to tell you. Someone is always going to have something that you don't have. Someone is always going to be more attractive in some ways and less attractive in other ways. You are going to have things better than other people as well. You're going to be more attractive in some ways and less attractive in other ways. The comparison game is painful and it never leads anywhere except to chip away at your self-esteem and chip away at your self-worth. It's not worth even looking into. It's not worth comparing. So you either trust that the person is with you because they want to be with you for all of the qualities that they like or you don't. You come to an acceptance that they want to be with you, period. It sounds like your husband wants to be with you, period. He wants to be with you. He's there. He's doing everything he possibly can to show you that he is committed. Again, this is according to your letter. I don't know what's happening there, but according to what you're saying, he now wants to make this relationship work. The question is, do you? You may not. Maybe it was just too hard and you do have to go. Maybe you do have to leave him. I don't know. I'm not telling you which direction to go with that, but it sounds like you really want to keep this thing. Sounds like you want to make it work. And if that's the case, Step forward into the fire, risk getting burned, and just enjoy what you have now. Enjoy what you have today. This is how I live my life. A lot of people actually don't understand it because I've gotten burned in relationships. I don't know if I've gotten cheated on. It's possible, but I've gotten burned pretty badly. I was in love with my wife probably more than ever during the last year of our marriage. I had done a lot of personal growth, and I was at the point where I felt the most love for her than I've ever felt. And then she asked for a divorce. And it <laughs> it burned. It hurt bad. But you know, within a year, you know, I'd done a lot of healing, done a lot of personal growth, some more personal growth, and I was ready to give my heart 100% to the next person. I was. Why? Because I choose to be happy today instead of thinking that they could break up with me tomorrow. For me, it's a matter of focus. Do I focus on what could happen? Or do I just enjoy what I have now going, wow, this is fantastic. I'm going to enjoy it while I have it. It's like having a lot of cash. Someone hands you a lot of cash and says, you need to spend this. (laughs) Do you think about it running out? Or do you think, wow, I have all this cash in my hand. I'm going to go spend it. This is going to be fun. If you can get to that point, Jill, you might be able to push through what you're feeling and have a fantastic relationship. In fact, if you open the barriers of communication between you two, risking that some of the truths could hurt, you can have one of the strongest relationships of all the people you know because you've been to hell and back. So that's what I want for you. I hope this helps. Thank you so much for writing. If you have a follow-up that you want to share with me, 
feel free to write me back. It's paul at theoverwhelmedbrain.com. My heart is with you, and I wish you the best. Now let's go to our next segment called What's in the Box? Before I share what's in the box, which is something unique today, I promise, I want to let you know that if you listen to this show but just can't seem to get past specific challenges in your life, whether it's a moment of decision or a past or future event that you just can't seem to let go of and you can't escape those depressing or anxious thoughts that seem to reappear over and over again, I'm here to help you one-on-one. I do my best to share everything I know with you on the show, but sometimes you need a little personal guidance every now and then. So if that's the case for you, go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com and click on Coach with Paul. There, you'll see what I do and how much I charge and all that jazz. So if you're ready to drop off your emotional baggage and start living a more fulfilling life today, try coaching with me. I have clients worldwide, and it's all done online or on the phone, so don't let your location stop you from inquiring about my coaching services. And in case you've already seen my prices and gasped, (laughs) well, my rates change based on my availability and demand. So check back often and reach out when you're ready to reclaim your power and tackle the challenges in your life. Visit TheOverwhelmedBrain.com and click on Coach with Paul. I look forward to talking with you personally soon. All right, time for our next segment, What's in the Box? And today I have something very unique, something I've never done on this show, which is I am going to read you a short story. Now, why am I doing this? (laughs) Because in many parts of the world, it's Christmas. And this short story isn't necessarily about Christmas. It's about giving. It's about um, what giving is really about, or at least what it is to me. And you've probably actually heard this story. So if you've heard it, just sit back, relax, and listen again. (laughs) Or if you haven't heard it, I think you're going to enjoy the moral, the the underlying message here, or very overt message actually, but uh, I think you'll enjoy it. It's called The Gift of the Magi. Now, here's just a funny quick side story here. Uh, I went to look for a version to read online, and the versions I found have a lot of uh, older English words, <laughs> and a lot of them that I don't even know the definitions to, and I had to look them up. Like, I didn't know what medicancy means. And for those of you who are interested, medicancy, if that's the way you pronounce it, means beggar or begging. So instead of defining these words as I read the story, I wanted to find a a more readable story so that I could read it to you without so much uh, pausing and defining words as I go. So the version I found was on AmericanEnglish.state.gov. And the copyright on this story has expired, which allows me to read this on the air to you. And I hope you enjoy it. I did find one that I can read easily, and I'm going to do that right now. This is called The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. That was all. She had put it aside, one cent and then another and then another. In her careful buying of meat and other food, Della counted it three times, one dollar and eighty-seven cents, and the next day would be Christmas. There was nothing to do but fall on the bed and cry. So Della did it. While the lady of the home is slowly growing quieter, we can look at the home. Furnished rooms at a cost of eight dollars a week, There's little more to say about it. In the hall below was a letter box, too small to hold a letter. There was an electric bell, but it couldn't make a sound. Also, there was a name beside the door. Mr. James Dillingham Young. 
when the name was placed there, Mr. James Dillingham Young was paid $30 a week. Now, when he was being paid only $20 a week, the name seemed too long and important. It should perhaps have been Mr. James D. Young. But when Mr. James Dillingham Young entered the furnished rooms, his name became very short indeed. Mrs. James Dillingham Young put her arms warmly about him and called him Jim. You have already met her. She is Della. Della finished her crying and cleaned the marks of it from her face. She stood by the window and looked out with no interest. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she only had $1.87 with which to buy Jim a gift. She had put aside as much as she could for months with this result. $20 a week is not much. Everything had cost more than she had expected. It always happened like that. Only $1.87 to buy a gift for Jim. Her Jim. She had had many happy hours planning something nice for him. Something nearly good enough. Something almost worth the honor of belonging to Jim. There was a looking glass between the window of the room. Perhaps you have seen the kind of looking glass that is placed in $8 furnished rooms. It was very narrow. A person could see only a little of himself at a time. However, if he was very thin and moved very quickly, he might be able to get a good view of himself. Della, being quite thin, had mastered this art. Suddenly, she turned from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brightly, but her face had lost its color. Quickly, she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its complete length. The James Dillingham Youngs were very proud of two things which they owned. One thing was Jim's gold watch. It had once belonged to his father, and long ago it had belonged to his father's father. The other thing was Della's hair. If a queen had lived in the rooms near theirs... Della would have washed and dried her hair where the queen could see it. Della knew her hair was more beautiful than any queen's jewels and gifts. If a king had lived in the same house with all his riches, Jim would have looked at his watch every time they met. Jim knew that no king had anything so valuable. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her, shining like a falling stream of brown water. It reached below her knee. It almost made itself into a dress for her. And then she put it up on her head again, nervously and quickly. Once, she stopped for a moment and stood still while a tear or two ran down her face. She put on her old brown coat. She put on her old brown hat. With the bright light still in her eyes, she moved quickly out the door and down to the street. Where she stopped, the sign said, Mrs. Sofrany, hair articles of all kinds. Up to the second floor, Della ran and stopped to get her breath. Mrs. Sofrany, large, too white, cold-eyed, looked at her. Will you buy my hair? asked Della. I buy hair, said Mrs. Sofrany. Take your hat off and let me look at it. Down fell the brown waterfall. Mm, twenty dollars, said Mrs. Sofrany, lifting the hair to feel its weight. Give it to me quick, said Della. Oh, and the next two hours seemed to fly. She was going from one shop to another to find a gift for Jim. And she found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the shops, and she had looked in every shop in the city. It was a gold watch chain, very simply made. Its value was in its rich and pure material. Because it was so plain and simple, you knew that it was very valuable. All good things are like this. It was good enough for the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that Jim must have it. It was like him. Quietness and value. 
Jim and the chain both had quietness and value. She paid $21 for it, and she hurried home with the chain and 87 cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim could look at his watch and learn the time anywhere he might be. Though the watch was so fine, it never had a fine chain. He sometimes took it out and looked at it only when no one could see him do it. When Della arrived home, her mind quieted a little. She began to think more reasonably. She started to try to cover the sad marks of what she had done. Love and large-hearted giving, when added together, can leave deep marks. It is never easy to cover these marks, dear friends. Never easy. Within 40 minutes, her head looked a little better. With her short hair, she looked wonderfully like a schoolboy. She stood at the looking glass for a long time. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself, before he looks at me a second time, he'll say I look like a girl who sings and dances for money. But what could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and 87 cents? At seven, Jim's dinner was ready for him. Jim was never late. Della held the watch chain in her hand and sat near the door where he always entered. Then she heard his step in the hall, and her face lost color for a moment. She often said little prayers quietly, about simple, everyday things. And now she said, Please, God, make him think I'm still pretty. The door opened, and Jim stepped in. He looked very thin, and he was not smiling. Poor fellow. He was only 22, and with a family to take care of. He needed a new coat, and he had nothing to cover his cold hands. Jim stopped inside the door. He was as quiet as a hunting dog when it is near a bird. His eyes looked strangely at Della, and there was an expression in them that she could not understand. It filled her with fear. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor anything that she had been ready for. He simply looked at her with that strange expression on his face. Della went to him. Jim, dear, she cried. Don't look at me like that. I had my hair cut off and sold it. I I couldn't live through Christmas without giving you a gift. My hair will grow again. You won't care, will you? My hair grows very fast. It's Christmas, Jim. Let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful nice gift I got for you. You've cut off your hair? Asked Jim slowly. He seemed to labor to understand what had happened. He seemed not to feel sure he knew. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Don't you like me now? I'm me, Jim. I'm the same without my hair. Jim looked around the room. You say your hair is gone? He said. You don't have to look for it, said Della. It's sold, I I tell you, sold and gone too. It's the night before Christmas, boy. Be good to me because I sold it for you. Maybe the hairs of my head could be counted, she said, but no one could ever count my love for you. Shall we eat dinner, Jim? Jim put his arms around his Della. For ten seconds, let us look in another direction. Eight dollars a week or a million dollars a year. How different are they? Someone may give you an answer, but it will be wrong. The Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. My meaning will be explained soon. From inside the coat, Jim took something tied in paper. He threw it upon the table. I want you to understand me, Dell, he said. Nothing like a haircut could make me love you any less. But if you'll open that, you may know what I felt when I came in. White fingers pulled off the paper. And then a cry of joy. And then a change to tears. For there lay the combs. The combs that Della had seen in a shop window and loved for a long time, 
beautiful combs with jewels perfect for her beautiful hair. She had known they cost too much for her to buy them. She had looked at them without the least hope of owning them. And now they were hers. But her hair was gone. But she held them to her heart and at last was able to look up and say, My hair grows so fast, Jim. And then she jumped up and cried, "Uh Uh-oh! Jim had not yet seen his beautiful gift. She held it out to him in her open hand. The gold seemed to shine softly, as if with her own warm and loving spirit. Isn't it perfect, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at your watch a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how they look together. Jim sat down and smiled. Della, said he, let's put our Christmas gifts away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use now. I sold the watch to get the money to buy the combs. And now I think we should have our dinner. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men. They were the first to give Christmas gifts. Being wise, their gifts were doubtless wise ones. And here I have told you the story of two children who were not wise. Each sold the most valuable thing he owned in order to buy a gift for the other. But let me speak a last word to the wise of these days. Of all who give gifts, these two were the most wise. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are the most wise. Everywhere, they are the wise ones. They are the Magi. That was The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry. And thanks so much for letting me read that to you. It was a little bit unusual for this show, but I wanted to read something in the spirit of Christmas for those that celebrate and even for those that don't. Because the story is really about what you do to give, not necessarily what you give. It's the effort that you put in and the thought and the heart that you put into giving and not what you spent on it or what object you gave to someone else. I mean, think about it. How many things do you own that someone gave you that they bought at a store, let's say 20 years ago? You know, you might still own them, you might not. But I bet if you have kids and they made you something 20 years ago and it took them hours, (laughs) or even if it took them a few minutes, you probably still have it to this day. Or if you don't, it probably got lost or maybe it was replaced with something else they made. But You know what I'm saying. The gift is in the giving. And there's also a gift in receiving. People who give love to see people receive. And they love to see their expression. They love to see the happiness that comes across their face. So remember, if you get something from someone that you didn't necessarily want, remember what they were doing when they were getting it for you. I told you the story a week or two ago about when I was married, my wife came home with a gift of a bunch of cliff bars. And I don't like cliff bars, so I focused on what I didn't like about what happened. I focused on the fact that I didn't like cliff bars and I'll have to trade them in for something else. This tore her apart. This really hurt. Because at the time, she was thinking of me. She was taking her time and energy out of her own day and thinking of me doing what she thought would be a nice gesture, giving me snacks to eat throughout the day. And I just treated it as a gift I didn't like. And that hurt. And that really affected our relationship at that time. And it took a while to get past that. So I know you know this, but it's not always the gift. It's the giving. And if you can see the giving as the gift, the gratitude is there. The love is there. The connection and the bonding are there. Because that's what's most important. Whatever you celebrate this year, or whatever you don't celebrate this year, I want you to enjoy the gift of giving and receiving 
in any way possible and show those around you that you really care about them for who they are and what they do for you. I wish you the best. Thanks for joining me. We'll talk again soon. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank Asha with GetOutOfTheMess.com. You can move forward alone and hope things go well, or you can pay less than a dollar a day to get a team of attorneys to get you through almost any situation. If you're in the U.S. or Canada, visit GetOutOfTheMess.com or call 678-355-8777 and talk with Asha today. I want to thank everyone who has purchased a book or a worksheet or use the Amazon link to shop as you normally would, which gives us pennies for every dollar you spend. Your contributions and shopping habits are making a difference. So thank you. I also want to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in today's episode. And in closing, I want to say this really quick. We talked about some hard stuff today. We talked about infidelity cheating on your partner and how that feels to the other person getting cheated on and sometimes how it feels to the person who cheated because after the act they might feel guilty they might regret what they did but what I really want to reemphasize right now is that when you have someone else's heart in your hands be nice be good be committed and if you can't be nice and be good <laughs> If you can't not hurt their heart, then give it back. And you know, that doesn't just fall under the cheating category. That falls in almost everything we do every day when we have someone else's heart in our hands. When someone trusts us completely and they feel safe with us, don't betray that trust. And if you've done it in the past, don't betray it again. Know that what you're doing is eating away not only at the integrity that you've built between each other, but the more you damage that integrity between you two, the less safe they feel with you. The less safe they feel, the less you communicate. The less you communicate, the more your relationship disintegrates and the more likely someone is going to do something that betrays the other. So give the gift of protecting their heart and being sensitive to their needs so you can continue strengthening the good and wiping away any of the bad that might have happened or has built up. And if it ever comes to a point where you want to step out of the relationship, do them the honor of giving them their heart back. You know, it doesn't mean it's the end. It could mean that you take a break for a while and then you come back together and things are great. Or it could mean that Maybe it wasn't meant to last as long as you thought it was in the first place. Yes, relationships can last indefinitely as long as both of you are working at it and being honest with some hard truths. Sometimes it takes admitting the hard truths of what's going on inside of you to get even closer than you've ever been. And usually what we think is that it's going to split us apart, and sometimes it does, but In order to get closer, sometimes you just have to take that risk. And when it doesn't work out, then maybe it wasn't going to be anyway. Because if you need to be authentic with someone and your authenticity rubs them the wrong way, maybe it's someone that won't be able to handle uh, honest, hard truths anyway. But always do what's right for you. Always honor yourself And honor them by telling them the truth. It may be hard. It may be devastating. But it gets out there so you can work with it. And if you don't want to take my advice and hold on to those truths, that's your decision and I honor that too. And with that, open your mind and step into your power. And be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing.